Hi everyone, I'm having an interview with Dorothy Drew. Uh, she's my RCT um, friend and also RCT therapist. And she was also trained as a doula who supports mother throughout the birth. And welcome to the interview and thank you for accepting my uh, request. Thank you. Um, anyway, as, as we've been discussing, there's a lot of stuff about birth in the media, in stories, that is wrong. Yeah. So uh, it's fear and birth should be joyous, it should be calm, it should be wonderful. And so when you see a movie or a TV show that shows a woman suffering, shows a woman in agony, that especially if young girls see that, then they, they become afraid. And the best way to get rid of the fear is to have knowledge and to have someone who can give knowledgeable support to reduce the sensations so that you know, the sensation should never be more than a, a heavy menstrual cramp or some backache. It should never be the kind of scene that you see in a movie where a woman's stand step and screaming. It's, that's just not the way it should be. And doulas came about through some work that was done in Brazil. So at one time, in the 1950s, 1960s, Brazil had the lowest rate of C-sections in, you know, I, I don't know where they, but from wherever they, they did this comparison. And in a period, a very short period, like 10 years, it flipped. So it went from being the country with the lowest rate of C-sections to being the highest rate of c-sections and in 10 years you know women's bodies hadn't changed why did the medicine change what was going on so they did some research to try and understand so one of the things they did was they they had a woman with a clipboard and a, a checklist sit in the room with a woman from the point she came to the hospital until she gave birth and then they found the women in this study group had fewer c-sections and it was like how could this be this woman all she did was sit there with a clipboard and a pen she didn't do anything she was not encouraged to talk to the woman she was not encouraged to provide comfort method what was going on so they talked to the mothers and the mother said something like well she was sitting there in the room and as long as she was calm i knew everything was okay so i was calm <laughs> so just that presence of a calm, you know, you know, person beside her. So she wasn't alone. She had somebody there who was relaxed and was dealing with things. The mother stayed calm. And if the mother stays calm, her body responds. So they took another st study and they went a little bit further. They said, well, what if instead of this woman just being with a clipboard, what if she's actively being there with, you know, you know, providing, you know, ice, providing drinks, providing a heating pad, just touching her. And the, the changes were even more phenomenal. And so that became the idea that a doula was essential. A doula makes a difference. And a doula in evolutionary times would have been the woman's mother, grandmother, aunts, you know, people who cared about her. And it would have been a very female-centered kind of activity. So in our day, what the doula can do is by understanding what's happening with what the mother's going through, even if the mother doesn't really know all the details, it can help just to help keep the calmness uh, and help the father help the father stay calm. <laughs> so what I was going to talk about is just bits and pieces of what I learned through my doula training. Um, my daughter had both of her children at home. Uh, it was, you know, planned. And in the area where she lived, she could get the, the midwife. But midwives today have changed the way 
they function. So at least in Canada. So it used to be a midwife would be with a woman from the time she started labor and stay with her. Midwives now are more in a medical kind of aspect. So they arrive closer to the time of the birth, which leaves the mother on her own until closer to the to the birth and and even if your husband's with you your, or your partner they're not trained they've never maybe you know if it's a first birth it might they don't they don't know what to expect and it's really really hard to see someone you love in pain for me if i had not been trained as a doula to you know the first birth other than my own births the first birth I witnessed was hers. And if I hadn't been trained as a doula, first of all, I might have been more freaked out about her sitting in a pool of water to give birth. I might have been more freaked out about everything going on. But more, I wouldn't have known what kinds of movements or things could help her go faster, be, you know, have a shorter delivery. And so, so anyway, I was so, it, it was such a joyous occasion. That's when I, I just said, well, this is something I really want to do. And I've, I've been with several women who I, I worked with who also were in situations where they didn't have a grandmother nearby and, or didn't have a training or couldn't afford a doula or couldn't get a doula. So I worked with them and it was always a learning experience. It was something I thought I was going to do in retirement because I love doing it. And then the last birth I was witness for, doula for, it was like three days. And I thought, I'm not, I can't do this. And I, I, I sort of wish I knew then what I knew know now about the more emotional aspects. Because she was someone who had, whose mother had a traumatic birth. And when I went to her place, and she'd already been in labor for a while, her room was brightly lit up. She was in the living room, lots of light. And, and that's not the way birth is supposed to be. It should be dim light. And, and when you go to the hospital and they have all the bright fluorescent lights, just light can slow down. And, and uh, we're meant to be able to go into labor and stop the labor if there's danger so that you know if the tiger's nearby if we're in labor we don't want to give birth when the tiger's there so it's we have chemicals in our brain that can stop labor with fear yeah and that allows the woman to go to a safe place that's called that that, yeah but that fear whether the fear is because there's a tiger nearby or because a woman doesn't know what's going on or because being changed, that fear stops. Labor extends it, and and the longer labor goes on, the more chances there are of medical intervention. And once there's medical intervention, it becomes a cycle. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, so that's sort of a summary of what I've done as a doula. So anyway, I realized I, I don't have the stamina to do this kind of thing. So, um, but uh, I, I would love to otherwise. So one of the, I, I learned a lot in the doula training. It was, a, it was a four day, very intense course. I've attended several conferences that were about birthing for many years. I was really into reading stuff about midwifery, uh, being on midwifery Facebook groups, and it was just, I thought, fascinating. So I'm just going to do a summary of some of the kinds of, of things that you might not easily find. So I really highly recommend any of the videos or the books about doulas because they will give your husband a chance to understand. The more understanding you have of your own body, then as you go through the process of, of delivery, you, you sort of, you know what's going on, you know. So the big thing to understand is that any birthing sensation, even at the height of just before the baby's born, is a short period of time, you know, intense, but short, and then you've got a period to relax. So before anything even happens, the interaction with your husband matters. And, and that woman, the last one I had, I found she didn't have sex with her husband 
after she became pregnant because they were afraid of damaging the, the baby. Well, your body is designed to protect the baby. Your body is designed for the chemicals of orgasm to be good for the mother, good for the baby. And, but it tells the mind that, okay, the, I'm going to say father. Okay, so the father is there. The father is, his job is to protect the mother. So if you're having sex with him, your body can relax because your body knows you're safe. The other thing they've found out is that there are chemicals in the semen that promote the beginning of the birth process. So birth will happen even if you don't have sex with somebody, but it will happen faster and more when you want it with the presence of semen, those chemicals. So there are times like for risk of premature babies where the physician may tell you, no, they won't even allow you to hug your husband because those chemicals might promote labor. And, but when it's time, when you're at your due date, when you're big, you're, you want it to be over with, the more sex you can have, <laughs> the better. <laughs> yeah, so it, is it uh, with the oxytocin hormone? You know, when you well, deliver, you see that more of that oxytocin, right? Well, there is, it's even beyond that. There is an actual chemical that's used medically to promote labor, especially if the woman's, you know, beyond her due date. And that chemical was originally derived from semen. Ah, that's so cool. there. I, I, I don't, I, I should have looked up what the name was, but anyway, <laughs> just say there's a chemical there. And this chemical will signal the body to begin childbirth yeah you know <laughs> and uh and and one of the uh, one of the comfort measures is that being held by the father and uh you know that's so important touch matters so much so at the very beginning before it's even defined as labor changes have to happen i was trying to find some pictures and i couldn't find any that illustrated it as well as my doula teacher who had a really proper kind of thing but if you think of this as the uterus so this is the top of the uterus and the baby inside and then the cervix so yeah. the cervix throughout pregnancy it's thick and it's long, it's holding the baby in, it's protecting the baby. What it has to do before it can begin to dilate, which is opening, which is when the beginning of labor is, is defined, is it has to thin. And in order to do that, the muscles at the top of the uterus begin to contract and they pull, pull it, the uterus up until this, this cervix is thin. It's still closed, but it's thin. And that process can start two, three weeks before birth. You know, little tiny sensations. Um, it can happen in 20 minutes. But if a woman's afraid, it can take a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's a period of time where a woman usually has a burst of energy. And it's so frequent that it's called like nesting. And, you know, women will go crazy cleaning up the house, getting prepared, getting the babies. Don't waste your energy because that energy is precious. So what is good is doing things like going for a walk because walking is emotion. It rocks the baby, it soothes the baby, but it begins the process of childbirth. So by walking, there's the, the pelvic bones are fused together by cartilage ligaments. And during pregnancy, that starts to, to stretch out. That, that's part of, you know, like women who have had childbirth will have bigger hips because those ligaments stretch out and will never get back to, you know, that's a badge of honor. But during the childbirth process, those ligaments become much more liquidy and they will actually stretch. So the hips will open up. And because we're upright, it means a difference in how the pelvic bones form. So 
the very top of the hip joints, it's an oval, not a, not a circle. And it's oval with the biggest part being from the front of the body to the back of the body. So to begin with the body has, the baby has to go down with its head facing either forward or backwards. If it tries to go sideways, it can't go, it has to go that way. But then it gets part way through and the formation of the hip opening changes. So then the widest part is between the hips. So it's wider sideways. And th so that means for the baby to get its head through, to get shoulders through, it has to go down facing frontwards or backwards, and then it has to turn and then it can come out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's that change, that bottom part where most mammals don't have that, it's because we have legs that operate upright, especially for men. I mean, that's how they tell the difference between a male pelvis and a female pelvis, that on men, the hip joint is almost straight up and down and women is slightly outwards. But that closure, that allows the, the muscles that hold our pelvic girdle together, that the muscles that hold our insides in our body needs that bone formation. And so one of the interesting things is um, babies are born before they ought to be. Uh, if you compare the abilities of a newborn child to a newborn mammal of any kind, other mammals are born at about the stage our babies reach at around three months. But if we, if we had three more months of pregnancy, the baby wouldn't be able to come out. So this is the compromise. The babies are born vulnerable. They're born, they're born earlier than they should be needing that extra care. And so it's really useful to think of the first three months of the baby's life as an extension of the pregnancy. And in cultures that really promote motherhood, women are, are taken care of during that time. So the mother should focus only on her baby and there should be other people to do the housework, the cleaning, the, the cooking, the taking care of the mother. And in our society, a lot of times women have their baby, they go home, their husband's at work, they're isolated. And that's the, you know, that's a terrible, terrible thing to do to a new mother. When my daughter's baby had her first baby, I, I went down there, I got there on a Friday and I said, okay, I've got my holidays, I'll be here for six weeks. And, and, and I, I remember my daughter looked at her husband, you could see them thinking, mom's here for six weeks, yikes, we just wanted for the birth. And by the time it was time for me to leave, they were like, couldn't you stay another week? Do you have to leave? <laughs> <laughs> which made me feel great <laughs> and uh anyway so so anyway so the, so is that um That's so the, the, that whole process is, yeah. is so synchronized with so much it's uh our body is designed uh to deliver the baby naturally and yes. to utilize that strength and natural ability capacity um what are what holds us back or what would help us embrace that okay there are different comfort well comfort measure you know warmth um warm water uh even a warm compress you know so at the very beginning labor might be most commonly might be in the front my labor for my daughter was entirely on my back so that defines depending on how the baby positions its head to come out. So while the cervix is thinning and the woman has energy, that's a really good time to do walking. Because walking, you know, it, it stretches the ligaments of the hips, but it also jostles the baby's head down into the correct alignment. And if you think of it like putting on a turtleneck, there's two ways of doing it. The norm, you can put it, you know, with your the crown of your head coming first, or you can do it with the, your, the forehead coming first. 
most commonly babies do it with the crown of the head coming first and that sensation is felt on the woman's front. If the baby comes through with the forehead first, it, it puts different pressure on different nerves and that's back pain. Oh. <laughs> so for when I had my daughter, I, I was, um, I knew I had doctor's appointments, so I didn't think about it, but I just kept thinking, why is my back so sore? I had no idea labor sensations could be in your back. And, and I was, I was shopping, I was doing all kinds of things. And every once in a while I had to stop because my back hurt so much. And when I finally saw the doctor, she said, well, you know, you're about two centimeters dilated. You maybe should go to the hospital now. <laughs> I was like, but all I had was back pain. <laughs> but that, but I didn't make, and so it was a good thing I didn't know. So that whole early part of my birth, I was walking. And, uh, and so I got to the hospital around three o'clock and then my baby was born at six. So it can go that fast. And I was in the birthing room at the hospital. I had a midwife who was with me from the moment I got there. So then at that point where the baby's making the descent, you know, you want to do motions that make that opening as large as possible. So things like sitting on a, you know, big exercise ball and rolling forwards and backwards, and letting your hips move forwards and backwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you think of videos you've seen of women belly dancing, the origins of belly dancing was it was a dance for women and it was all about the muscles of childbirth. So that rocking the hips back and forth at that stage makes a difference. You're rocking it back and forth, forward and to, to wide, you know, allow that opening, the front to the back to get wider. Comfort measures depend on, you know, if it's belly, um, belly sensations, you know, the warmth, the mis light massage, the holding. Um, one of the things the doula trainer said, you know, the husband's genitalia should be as close as possible to the woman's genitalia. So she <laughs> promoted, at that point, um, slow dancing kind of motions where ah. you're putting, putting your weight on the husband. He's got his arms around you. <laughs> his, you know, his, his stuff is... His, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. You're creating that warm, uh, safe environment, right. and also our our skin has uh, sensors that creates um, happiness hormones. Yeah, that yeah. touch. The touch. But, that touch. Yeah. but staying upright helps, you know. But you know, if you go to the hospital and they put you flat on your back and they put these monitors on you, you know, flat on your back stops gravity from assisting you it slows it down it's you've got this thing around you you can't move it's it's scary yeah. so even if you are in the hospital and they put these monitors around you you know if you can try and have it so that it's one that allows you to stand up walk a little bit you know having your husband's arms around you is really really makes a difference and then there's various exercises that you know like the rolling on an exercise ball is really, really good. And, and so at that stage, and then when the baby starts to turn, you want to do motions that stretch the body sideways. So things like squatting, which is why the normal childbirth position is a squat and the childbirth chair makes it more comfortable for a woman to be in that squatting position. A childbirth chair will have arms on it so a woman can squat down. Um, yeah. Flat on your back just isn't as good a way of doing things. Uh, the body isn't designed to be. No. Um, the story I heard was there was a, a king of France who wanted to see his baby born. And so that was the first time where a woman was sort of flat on her back to have a baby. Yeah. At the hospital, so, they just, uh, if you get um, epidural and any pain medication, you have to lay down on your bed and they just labor like this and so it's it goes against the nature that na natural capacity for us to deliver a baby and it makes our if they ever want to do medical intervention you sort of say well what will it do but also you say what what happens if i don't mm. so 
the epidural, if, if you're coping, you know, if you're, you know, you know, you have that really short period of time of intense sensation, and then you can relax, um, that means you don't need the epidural because mm -hmm. there are complications that can happen. You know, um, and I was told, there, uh, my doula teacher said she was at one place and half of it worked. So the woman had the full sensation on one half of your uterus and nothing on the other half. Uh, the worst case is that the epidural can somehow go up the spine and cause what's called a, an epidural headache. And that can force you to be flat in your back for six weeks after the birth. Yeah. And so the more you can avoid intervention, but still not, you know, be coping is it makes a difference. So those, you know, I, I mean, the birth partner book is a whole book. I mean, it was a three day course, you know, various kinds of things. So, so, you know, so maybe one particular motion, one position is good for two sensations, and then you need to change. So being on, you know, hands and knees can take a lot of pressure off um, being in the child's pose of yoga and shifting from that child's pose to, I think it's up dog, you know, you're just rocking back and forth. Yeah. That, that allows the, the, the hips to open up, to relax, which is what you want. Being aware, if you clench your fist, you're taking oxygen. So opening your fist automatic letting loose letting yeah. go letting but go allow yeah but allowing more oxygen to go to the uterus go to the baby you know so you're not draining the oxygen away from the baby um and one of the really neat things is the shape of the mouth can mimic the shape of the cervix ah. so if you grimace if you tighten your lips yeah, you're signaling your mind, tighten the cervix and you want, so you want, <laughs> you want your mouth to be relaxed, you want your jaws to be relaxed, because you want your cervix to relax, yeah. to open up. <laughs> that is really mimics what's going on in our mind. So it, it makes me um, want to ask about this uh, mental and emotional aspect of delivery. And you before this interview, we talked about a little bit of emotional aspects. Okay. And then maybe we could touch on the mental aspects, which is the ability to make your mind and body cooperate, work together to make your delivery smooth. One of the observations of my doula instructor was that women who were born by C-section were more likely to need a C-section. And the theory was that maybe there's something about the chemicals, the oxytocin, maybe something needs to be triggered by a vaginal birth. But knowing now about how birth memories can be stored, I would say, you know, I mean, going into a C-section, even going into an epidural is scary because it stops sensation, it slows it down, it makes it longer. So I would say more likely women who were born by C-section will be carrying the trauma their mother went through. And, and the history of childbirth and what happens and how women are treated is, is fascinating. And that, that's whole books on it. And I said it was even going back to the time of the witch hunts because women were choosing to go with midwives because they had better results than with the physicians at the time, at least in Eastern and Western Europe. Um, you know, physicians who went from working with diseased people to childbirth without washing their hands and then wondered why the woman died of fever. Uh, so people observed that. People knew that it was safer to be with a midwife than a male physician. So what did they do? They started witch hunts against midwives. And midwives were some of the really targeted women in these slaughters. So even going back that long ago. And then in the around the 1920s with the development of anesthesia, they had they said, this is great. A woman won't feel anything. There won't be any pain. 
What they didn't say was, yes, the woman feels the pain, will be suffering even more, but she won't remember it. So what was happening is women were in intense agony. They were in so much agony, they were punching, they were clawing, they were hurting themselves or hurting the people around them. So what did the medical people do? They restrained them. So women were tied up. They were flat on their back, tied up, no. isolated, alone. And But when it was over, they didn't remember anything. And really, it's a tremendous joy, that memory. You know, I mean, you don't want to remember some of the sensations, but the whole overall experience is something to treasure. When my daughter was born and I went to visit uh, my husband's grandmother in the nursing home, there's all these women who are in their 80s and 90s. And, and I guess they hadn't had, you know, it was only urban areas, rich people got this anesthetic. They could remember the day of their birthing, the childbirth. And they could say, it was a sunny day and I did this laundry and then, I, I mean, they were 90 years old, so their birth experience was like 67 years ago, and they had that memory, they treasured it, and they wanted to share it. So by having the, making it an unpleasant experience, that's not a memory you would want to remember, memory you would want to share, but they had these drugs that made it so you forgot, you couldn't remember it. So they call it twilight sleep. It was a very unpleasant experience. So if you think of that, for me, that was my mother's era. My mother was in a rural area. She was born at home. But people my age, their mothers very possibly went through this experience, this twilight sleep, which was painful, agonizing, awful. So if those memories were stored up, then when they had childbirth, they would remember fear. And, and the, the movies and TV shows didn't help either. So for people your age, that's, that's maybe three generations, four generations ago, but how much of what you have from your birth memories is carried forward from your grandmother? And, 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 and the other really interesting thing to realize is the, the cell that produced you was produced in your mother's body while she was in utero. So the cell that produced you was contained inside your grandmother's body before. You. So I think that really, really is, a, um, to me, it's fascinating, this connection yeah. of how important grandmothers to mothers to mothers should be and how much of the, of the women who couldn't nurse their babies, couldn't connect to their babies, were in deep depression, had postpartum depression. How much of that was caused by the medical intervention that caused agony, caused fear, took away their chance to have a joyous memory? Yeah. And for me, my second pregnancy was <laughs> all kinds of things went wrong. And I had, I was, my twins were born when I was six months pregnant. So I was 27 weeks gestation. It was an emergency C-section. They were expected to be, they weren't expected to live. And so I've gone through both. <laughs> and, and they say it's actually worse to go through a C-section at that stage because your uterus, your uterus thins out as the baby grows. So my uterus is still, so there's a lot more tissue to heal. It was like a year after my twins birth before I had the strength and the stamina to do a full circuit of the grocery store, uh, before I could walk easily, before I could walk without pain. So, uh, so yes, my C-section was worse than say an at-term C-section, but having experienced a vaginal birth and having unmedicated vaginal birth and a C-section, I mean, hands down. <laughs> um, because if you have an epidural, your baby's coming out um, anesthetized. So when the baby's born, and, and then they often say, and, and so having, having a lactation consultant to be near you, having a woman knowledgeable about breastfeeding makes a huge difference. And um, 
a friend's daughter just had a baby and uh, and they said well they didn't bring her the baby for a whole bunch of reasons until her milk came in well it usually takes 24 to 48 hours before your milk comes in and the pre-milk the colostrum is so essential for the baby the colostrum is filled with antibodies and stem cells and this and i don't know if this is true but i was told that the scent of the colostrum is the same scent as the amniotic fluid so yeah. for the baby to be able to nurse the colostrum is a sense of being being at home being at peace being being cared for yeah. um and, and they've done studies where if they simply place the baby on the mother's stomach the baby will squirm and move up until the baby reaches her breast and what the baby's homing in on is the smell yeah <laughs> so uh like so it's that like colostrum... the baby baby is out and place the baby on the mother's uh, stomach uh, stomach but nothing in between bare to bear skin yes. to skin skin to That's skin very important yeah and and they tend now to to let the uh they don't cut the umbilical cord until it stops pulsating uh -huh. but the tradition was that you know as soon as the baby's out they tie it off and cut it off well that that reduces the amount of blood cells that can go into the baby and so the baby then it, there's more likely to be jaundice um, that kind of thing because we're not meant to be that way yeah. we're meant for the baby to stay attached until um, and and also by the initial like nursing immediately after childbirth allows the uterus to contract and allows the um, the placenta to be expelled and and so it's all connected it's all you know it's all it, it's all a very i mean we've had evolution to make it work and uh, so in evolutionary times you might not know my uterus is doing this or my bones are in this position but as a female child of a tribe you would have grown up witnessing childbirth and you would have witnessed the comfort measures that helped a woman you would have witnessed the kinds of of motions the kinds of positions that you know the woman the woman in labor the, the giving childbirth would have been encouraged to take you would have witnessed new mothers nursing their newborn you would have witnessed um older children being nursed um when my daughter was born my doctor insisted that you know six months no no uh no supplements which was really hard because back then maternity leave was was um 12 weeks yeah so i worked until my due date which was unheard of if i had gotten pregnant two years earlier they could have and probably would have fired me simply for being pregnant so there was a new change in the human rights law which allowed women to work while they were pregnant um, back in the 70s like as soon as a woman started to show she was usually fired it just was not accepted for a woman in with pregnancy to be in society <laughs> and and uh, so anyway i worked to the due date so i had my and that was the beginning the very beginning and, and i had a lot of people say to me you chose to have that child i as a taxpayer shouldn't be paying for you to have maternity leave <laughs> so uh, yeah. anyway but it was 12 weeks i mean now you figure it's it's like a full year um in europe it's five years so uh anyway i i so despite going back to ner to work i would i would uh, express my milk i didn't need a pump i could do it with my hands and my mother was babysitting my daughter and i'd give the frozen milk to her every morning and so my mother agreed you know but when i got to about six months my parents were starting to say you know yeah okay so i started to wean her but i was still nursing her and this extended nursing that was kind of maybe they, they, and my grandfather my grandfather had been born in 1902 and he came to my defense and he said he could remember as a child seeing the toddlers on his street so this would be about 1910 
and he said, if the mother did not nurse her toddler, the child died. So we're not talking newborns, we're not talking infants, we're talking two, three, four-year-old ch children being nursed, extended yeah. nurse. And uh, so I, I nursed my daughter until she was four. And I, I had great difficulty, great problems, but I did manage to nurse my sons. And uh, I nursed them until they were five. And what was really interesting is my one son who had extensive birth damage, um, he had his first seizure a week after I stopped nursing. Oh. And when I took him to the hospital, you know, because it was so severe, they said, well, he was, you know, premature. He had this brain damage. He, you know, if it was connected to the brain damage, he would have had seizures all the way along. And so, so nursing him, even though I was working, uh, I was a single mom by that point, um, was enough that his brain stayed calm and he didn't have seizures. Um. So, but that, that's, that whole idea of extended nursing is something that's maybe not entirely read about or known to you, but it's something that's really worth considering. That's right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Mongolia has the culture of uh, nursing for a longer period of time. And now, so, though, now with the um, media influence, they're trying to stop it earlier so that you can have your nice boobs and et cetera, et cetera, but... Um, In reality, uh, it's so much better for the mother. Yeah. I, I remember at one point I was nursing my daughter and she was getting close to a year and, and it had been a really stressful, awful day and she was having trouble and she finally, finally my milk let down and I felt this rush of, it was probably oxytocin, but this, it was like being high. And I was just felt, I, I, and it, it really struck me, I realized, my house could be on fire right now and I wouldn't care. I felt so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So but what they find, the longer you nurse a child, um, and especially if you're doing complete total nursing, no supplements, no water, it delays the menstrual periods, which means you've got more blood, more energy for your own health. With my twins, they spent three months in the intensive care unit. My periods had come back before they were out of the hospital, but maybe especially because they were twins, because I did exclusive nursing, my period stopped again for about six yeah. months. Um, women have less breast cancer the longer and more babies that they nurse. Yeah. Their babies will have better dental stuff because you have to work to nurse, you know, um, you don't have to work so hard to drink from a bottle. So babies who are nursed, especially ext extended nursing, are less likely to require or orthodontics are less likely to require, you know, or if they do, it'll be for a shorter time. Um, they're getting the stem cells from the mother, so they're less likely to get sick. Uh, my daughter was not on antibiotics until after I stopped nursing her. So she was like four and a half the first time she had a bout of antibiotics. I, and she was at a walk-in clinic and the doctor, the doctor had never seen a four-year-old who'd never been on it. Cause he said, well, what's her reaction to antibiotics? I said, she's never had them. And he was, he had never seen a child who was four years old who had never been on antibiotics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to the mother that they don't tell you about. There's a huge lot of benefits to the baby, but certainly for the newborn, that colostrum is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And, Hi, uh, Dorothy, can I um, uh, bring you back to uh, a question, which is when women are pregnant, Carrying, carrying the baby, uh, I found that this could be also a stressful time. There are a lot, they are anticipating fear. Uh, they don't know, you know, there's uh, uncertainty how they're gonna uh, live their life after the baby is born and et cetera, et cetera. All the worries and fears and anxiety. And maybe, you know, uh, you could be all, you know, all sorts of societal and cultural conditioning can affect 
but how, what would you suggest for those women who are experiencing high level of anxiety and stress and fear to, to, um, to relieve from it throughout the pregnancy and also during the delivery? There's that whole thing of you can't control what's out there. You can only control what's inside. So you just let it go and turn your thoughts inwards. You, you massage your baby, you sing to your baby, you focus on your baby, you tell your baby how much love you have, how you're excited, you're going to be thrilled to hold the baby. Yeah. You look forward to good things. You look forward to being able to hold that baby, being able to rock the baby, sing to the baby. You look forward to nursing the baby because it's, as long as you've got someone who can help you through the initial parts, the initial part can be uh, can be a challenge. Yeah. But when you get through that, it's wonderful. You look forward to happiness. You look forward to joy. Yeah. You um, you try to you try to emotionally connect to your partner. You have him massage your baby. You have him talk to your baby. You have him sing to the baby. You have sex. <laughs> you, you have orgasms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you just let go. You, you know, that mindfulness bit. Just focus on what's happening right now. What can I do right now? Mm. Right now, I can give my baby love. Right now, I can care for my body. Right now, I can... Um, I can, you know, do motions that will help to soothe my baby. Walking, walking is fantastic. That rocking, you know, that motion of rocking a baby, that's what the baby feels in the uterus. So you turn inwards. Yeah, yeah, turn inwards. And even if you have to, you work all day, you know, like I work to the end, you at least let yourself at night, you know, you know, focus on yourself when you get that surge of energy just before your baby's born you use it on yourself not on cleaning the house yeah um, you investigate I, I don't know in Mongolia if they encourage mothers to sleep with their babies oh yeah they do okay um uh, my baby was never in a crib except at my mother's place I had I had a mattress on the floor uh, my baby slept beside me. I knew I had to do this because I knew I had to go back to work. So I knew the only way she was going to get full, complete nursing was if I slept with her. Okay. And I found a few books that, that encouraged me. Um, there's a lot about why it's good to sleep with your baby. But in the culture of when my daughter was born, that was considered really, really dangerous. You know, you might roll yeah. over on your baby. And as the doula said, you know, as long as you're not drunk, you're not using drugs, you are not <laughs> going to roll over your baby. And I did, my husband tended to be a very restless sleeper. And there was one time he, he was rolling over and he sort of landed against Christine and she just whimpered and he immediately rolled back. So like even deep sleep, my husband was aware of this baby. So yeah. that's why a lot of times people say you shouldn't sleep with the baby because you won't sleep as well. But but compared to getting up to a crying baby and sitting in a chair and nursing the baby or giving the baby a bottle and going back to bed, I think you get a lot more sleep if the baby sleeps with you. Yeah. But nowadays... When my uh, twins were born, I did like musical beds because especially when they got to be toddlers. So I'd, I'd often go to sleep in one room and then I'd go to the other room. And then I... <laughs> and, and even when my daughter, after the, the, the boys were born and she was sort of independent, I remember one time she came up, she, she got up and went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and she came back and said, she came to me to put her back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than going to the bathroom and going back to bed herself, she she needed me to put her back to bed. So I was kind of like, oh no. Yeah. So uh, um, if you can be around other mothers with a baby at the same stage, it really helps. When I when my daughter was born, the Laleche League was a really crucial, you know, grassroots connecting kind of organization, and and I would go like once a month, and all these other women had babies like. Like when you have a baby that's six weeks old, the baby's going through certain problems that 
nobody else except another mother with a six month, six week old baby wants to talk about or cares about. When you've got a six week old baby and that baby has a diaper rash, that's that's life threatening. Yeah. <laughs> but only to another mother who has a six week old baby with a diaper rash. So if you can be around other women who are pregnant, um, be around women who have just had a, a newborn, you know, um, you know, just to, you know, because that's, that's real. Women being with their babies is real. The stuff, yeah. stuff in the world out there, that's yeah. not real. <laughs> exactly. And also throughout uh, the RTT practice, um, uh, I have learned that that early attachment is so critical that there shouldn't be nothing in between, including your phone and including your work. And as soon as the baby get this, gets the sense that I'm, I'm the second or I'm the third, I'm not that important. It really sets the baby up, uh, the, the infant, the baby up for the self-esteem issues. In Mongolia, does the grandmother have a lot of presence in the family? Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, that's sorry, good. go on. Yeah. There, there was some research done looking at the census of in Germany, medieval times, and they found that the families where the woman's mother lived with them had the highest rate of the children surviving childhood and becoming adults. Yeah. The families where no grandmother lived with them had the highest infant mortality rate. And the yeah. ones where it was the mother's father were in between. <laughs> they couldn't quite come up with why, but maybe maybe the father's mother doesn't get along as well with as the mother's <laughs> mother. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I know I had a lot of conflict with my mother, but once my daughter was born, I felt she was the only one who understood me. <laughs> I felt such a rapport with her that I hadn't awesome. felt. Yeah. And being able to be present with my daughter and spend, you know, the first few weeks with her when my granddaughter was born and then again when my grandson was born that made such a difference and I think my and when I was there for the birth of my grandson I spent most of my time being with my granddaughter being that transition from her being the only child to being part of a family mm -hmm. and and you know with her mother being focused on the newborn she would have without me being there, she would have been, I think, much more isolated. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> well, it's been an hour since we <laughs> talked about this amazing yeah. insights yeah. and such a, such a tremendous, um, how do you say, such amazing wisdom. And I'm glad that we had this conversation. Okay, and, okay. and to just look forward to the birthing process will be joyous, will be exciting, will yeah. be wonderful. And yeah. <laughs> and tell your mind that it's not something that you should be afraid. It's something that you like, like Dorothy says. I don't even say, don't even go with those words. The yeah. birthing sensations will be mild. They will go fast. My delivery will go quickly. I mean, like I say, but it, my daughter, um, I, I got to see her on the Friday and then we went out and her, 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 the midwife, I, I went to the midwife with her and the midwife said, well, it's going to be at least a week before your baby's born. And that night her water broke. We, you know, we did a long, long hike along the lake and then her water broke and, uh, and she wanted to do a, a, a belly cast. I don't know if you've seen that. It's it's like you put plaster bandages over your belly, and then afterwards you've got the shape, and then she's had it painted. And she, I think it's kind of gross, but she it meant something to her. It is painted, and but so she hadn't prepared the belly cast yet because she thought she had another week to go. So just having that warm um, plaster stuff along her belly, I think, soothed her in that initial stage. It was distracting, relaxing, that kind of stuff. And about two o'clock in the morning, she, you know, and, and I did, you know, I had her being on a ball. I had her doing slow dancing. I had her doing, you know, being on all fours. I had her, if every, every sensation I had her going in a different motion. About two o'clock in the morning, I told her husband, call the midwife, it's time. 
and he was like, you know, she's not going, you know, when, when they first, you know, she first went into birth, um, they called the midwife and, she, and the midwife said, oh, okay, I'll see you tomorrow night or Sunday. You know, this is Friday night and two o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, I was like, it's time to call the midwife. And he was like, <laughs> okay. So instead of calling the midwife directly, he called the, the answering service. So that it ended up being another midwife being sent out, which really upset my daughter. But um, the baby was born at six in the morning. Wow, four hours. And, uh, yeah, from the time it, yeah, and and the way was just the reaction, and and so um, and and she, they had her get in the pool, and uh, the warm like a warm bath, and it was like, fifteen minutes from the time she got in the pool and the baby came up, and uh, and the second time it was like I don't think she even needed us, you know. At one point we were, the midwives. There was always two midwives sent out when you have a home birth, and they come with all the equipment, uh, oxygen and everything. So we were sitting having tea, and Christine was sort of laying down in the living room floor, and every once in a while she'd sort of get up on her hands and knees and kind of moan, and then she'd lay down again and nap, and we were like, like she didn't need us to be there. And, and then she finally said, "Well, it's time," and she, um, <laughs> you know. So in the entire time, there was nothing. No grimacing, no screaming, no, you know, it was just like, you wouldn't have even known. All she did was like, you know, the kind of pain you have when you have your menstrual period. That's yeah. the maximum she had. Beautiful. Yeah. You... Because of course the second baby, she knew what was going on. Her body was primed, her body was ready. And uh, <laughs> Exactly. So just being calm, having somebody with you who knows what's going on, have someone with you to keep your husband calm. Yeah, very important. <laughs> anyway, we have this it's a new... wonderful topic. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful topic. And I find it so valuable because I'm 31 weeks pregnant and I'm due end of January. And just, you provided amazing, <laughs> amazing insights. I attended some prenatal classes, but they were more on the technical terms. But you provided this such a... I, I lucked out. When I got pregnant, I had a British nurse. And as soon as you know, it was verified and I was pregnant, she said, she gave me a list. This is the childbirth midwife you have to visit. This is the exercise for pregnant women class that you have to go to. This is the nutritionist you have to go to. And the midwife I went to, she was teaching a class for geared towards home births. And they just opened up a birthing room at the local hospital, which I got to use. And the difference was my, my friends were my age, you know, I, I had to pay the midwife quite a few, it was quite expensive. But my doctor said, this is where you have to go to. So I thought, okay, I have to go there. I have to pay her. And my friends all went to the public health unit, which was free. But the difference was I was trained. This is what you do to have your baby, you know, while I was pregnant. And my friends were trained. This is what you do until the doctor comes and gives you drugs. Completely different. <laughs> yeah, completely different. Exactly. And now I am I'm questioning if I should go to a hospital or have a have my baby at home. <laughs> uh, there are so few midwives in Canada. Your chances like uh, my my daughter signed up with her midwife like two weeks after she got pregnant. <laughs> oh. uh, if you can get a midwife, great. But there are very few. Very few, yeah. There are very few doulas. Um, so if you can't get a midwife, at least get a, mid, a doula, a doula who can come and be with you, hold your hand, you know, you know, say, remind you, you know, relax your mouth, remind you, relax your breathing, remind you, remind your husband, it's okay, let your husband calm down, um, who can go with you to the hospital. Um, who can maybe remind you to say when they tell you, okay, you, we want to put this monitor on you. And you can say, well, what happens if I don't? What can go wrong if I do? Because if you ask them, they have to tell you. If you don't ask them, they don't have to tell you. <laughs> so you say, what does this process do? Hmm. Before you even get attached to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, 
you okay and and if you, like they used to give a drug to uh, to speed up um the birth process yeah but that drug can have some serious serious side effects so then you say and what happens if i don't mm. yeah so those and a doula can just a doula can't un, cannot ask the questions for you but the doula can prompt you to say this is what you need to think about ask <laughs> and uh, so having a doula if you can get one um just to be with you because mm. your husband even if he's attended the childbirth classes even if he, he's read some of the books it's a new process for him and it's scary for him because because it's harder to watch someone you love in pain yeah exactly it's a, it's a painful process and also because of COVID I'm afraid that you only are allowed to have one person next to you yeah wow well if you can get a midwife and because it's only if you get a midwife who's comfortable with home births um like physicians will not agree to a home birth yeah um my niece is in whitehorse in the yukon she had both of her babies at home my sister was with her my sister wasn't trained as a doula but i gave her as much doula <laughs> hints as i possibly could she and her she read the book you know the birth partner and all this kind of stuff um she had everything went perfect with her first baby with the second baby um she had been in labor her, her cervix was fully dilated and they realized it was a breach and and so they called the ambulances but in the meantime the midwife was able to manipulate the baby into position as soon as the baby was manipulated position he came right out so they didn't need to go to the hospital but the ambulance they had two ambulances come so one ambulance was going to take care of the baby and one for the mother and she was okay so mm -hmm. having a and that was a midwife who was trained in Germany, who was trained for what to do with a breech baby. Mm. Um, so the, the, the experience of the doula makes a difference. The experience of the midwife makes a difference. But if all you can get is a, is a doula who's read a few books, that's better than nothing. Because, you know, you look back at that woman who sat in the corner of the room with a clipboard. Yeah. If... <laughs> made a difference so so having someone who knows who can give the comfort measures who can help you help you get on to an exercise ball like having an exercise ball is a really good thing to have or anything that's flexible allows you to move your hips um, uh, to suggest you. And, I mean and and at the beginning you you don't mind people telling you what to do towards the end you're like what do you mean you want my hands and knees? No. <laughs> but then they'll say, you'll feel better. Just try it, you know. Try yeah. get into the, the yoga position, the child's pose. And 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 you know, just you know, you know, get into different positions to see what position works for me. For me, like I said, the back pain, it was all back pain, it was all along my spine. And the the um the the midwife is like, if this is my spine, she would just press her fingers. And as long as she was pressing against it, it was like, it was a dull ache. Like it was nothing. She took her fingers off and was like, ah. <laughs> and then it was something, you know, up higher, up higher, down lower. And she was, you know, she spent like, I don't know, it's, it was probably only 20 minutes, but felt like a long time just pressing my back because that's where the pain was. Um, so with my daughter, when she was having her, her son, you know, a lot of times she was just simply holding her hands against her stomach and rocking back and forth. So anything, because when you have a muscle, because basically the muscles are cramping up. So you put counter pressure, the counter pressure balances that out. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like if you, if you've been running and, and you get a stitch in your side, you hold your hand against where the stitch is. It, yeah. it sort of forces the muscle to relax. And, and so having someone who knows what's going on, who can encourage you to try different positions will, will help. And that's where if you're in a culture where women are all gathered together when the woman has her baby, you learn that as a child. 
and yeah. we don't. So we have to use our, we have to use books, we have to use videos, we have to use courses to be in that same place where our ancestresses were 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. So we have that knowledge that we can gain through learning that they gained through experience. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. Thank you so anyway. <laughs> much. It's been amazing. And do you have, uh, I would like to leave the last few moments with you. And if there's anything you would like to share, go ahead. Uh, I could talk for hours and hours and hours. So this is just the beginning. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience to be a witness for. And uh, it's, uh, it's joyous. It's happy. Yeah. And keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much. Take care.